I was a depression child. As a child, I heard the stuff called money, but never saw any. There were seven of us children, and if we didn't love each other, we had nothing. That's about what it came to. It was well worth it. On October 29, 1929, the United States was thrown into the despair of the Great Depression in result of the stock market crash. As stock prices plummeted, masses of people tried to sell their stock, but with no hope. What had appeared to be the surest way to become rich soon became the path to bankruptcy. Millions of people were out of work and often would travel from place to place in need of help. Twelve years later, on December 7, 1941, Japanese aircrafts bombed Pearl Harbor in order to keep the U.S. Pacific Fleet from interfering with military actions that the Empire of Japan was planning, killing more than 2,000 people and officially entering the United States into World War II surprisingly lifting the U.S. out of the downfall of their economy. When Pearl Harbor happened, I was at home and war was a long way off for me. I wasn't thinking of it. This was a real shocker for us. I could just imagine the most horrible things happening, and I believe they did, but I didn't want to see it. Pearl Harbor will long be remembered. Women have served in military conflicts since the American Revolution. However, it wasn't until World War II that over 300,000 women served and were in all branches of the armed forces. With the help of Edith Rogers, a congresswoman from Massachusetts, women eventually had their own division known as the Women's Army Corps. Its primary purpose was to allow women to work with the Army to provide to the national defense the knowledge, skill, and special training of the women of the nation. I was down the loop one day and uh, there were two GIs, I thought, walking in front of me. And without thinking, I followed them. And uh, all of a sudden they disappeared and I looked up and I was at the recruiting office. That's how I got in the wax. When I was a child, I used to say, when I grow big, I'm going to walk, get in the Army. But I wasn't sure how I would get there. But to be led by two GI angels was pretty nice. In order to be considered as an applicant for the Women's Army Corps, a series of tests had to be taken, such as IQ tests and physical exams. Applicants had to be U.S. citizens between the ages of 21 and 45, be at least 5 feet tall, and weigh 100 pounds or more. Over 35,000 women from all over the country applied for less than 1,000 anticipated positions. I remember filling out the papers and they told me I had a very high IQ. So I asked what it was and they said 125. And I thought, that isn't very high, is it? <laughs> but they said very high, so then I had another test and they said I passed that 100%. And they made arrangements for my physical and my I tests and everything. Then I had to go home and tell the people I lived with and worked for that I was leaving them. My heart was so heavy because they loved me dearly. And a few days later I was gone on the troop train four days to Florida took basic down there at Daytona Beach. And from there, I went to Eastman, Kentucky T State Teachers College for Army Administration. And I thought, I must be getting ready for something big. And sure enough, when I graduated, they asked me where I'd like to go. I just said West, didn't care where I wanted to go. So they sent me to Fort Riley.
During the time of World War II, Fort Riley was a U.S. Army base located between Junction City and Manhattan in Kansas. The base was used for supply, transport, and service units. However, upon Iris' arrival, she was immediately assigned to her new title, which would eventually shape the outcome of her future at Fort Riley. They took me right up to the, the Commandant's office and told me that I would be the Assistant Sergeant Major. It's hard to explain the feeling. I felt I had the whole world in front of me. This was exactly what I expected to do when I got big. In the Commandant's office, the Sergeant Majors took care of all military communications, phone uh, calls, um, dis disposition of other supplies and directing. I learned to do everything in my office. That was the filing and the army regulations. Before I left home, I was engaged to a young man named John Lanning. He wanted to go to medical school, but the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor and he came rushing over to say we had to put our plans on hold because I have to go and enlist. And he was gone just like that. Hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese planned to invade the Philippines in order to take the entire Pacific Rim as part of a greater Japanese empire. However, the United States had acquired the Philippines in the Spanish-American War in 1898, making it their responsibility to aid in the defense of the islands. Together, about 30,000 Americans and more than 100,000 Filipinos gathered to face the Japanese. Within days, the American air fleet was destroyed and the Americans and Filipinos were ordered to retreat south to defend the Bataan Peninsula. After basic, he was sent to the Philippines. And he died in the Bataan Death March. General Wainwright was the officer in charge of that area down there. He was taken prisoner by the Jabs, and he made that long march from Corregidor to Bataan. The Bataan Death March was a result of General Wainwright and General Edward King surrendering their troops on April 9, 1942, in fear of the slaughter of thousands of American and Filipino soldiers by the advancing Japanese army. The 65-mile march from the Bataan Peninsula to the prison camp, Camp O'Donnell, began with 75,000 soldiers and ended with 60,000 survivors. In the words of one of the Bataan Death March survivors, Julio Barella, in the eyes of the Japanese, we were cowards who have surrendered, as they believed taking your own life was a far better fate. We were beaten, slapped, pushed, tortured, and yelled at while we marched. I was struck on the back of the head with the butt of a rifle of one of my captors. I remember thinking of my mother and how she would suffer if I died. Several of my comrades fell from fatigue on top of illness and would not go on. They were immediately killed. All the time I thought I would be next. When I was at Fort Riley, they were building a B-29 bomber at Wichita, and they were sadly in need of funds, so I started buying a war bond every payday out of my many sergeant's pay, and other people did the same thing. So we got that airplane built. When it came close to finish, they asked us if we would like to offer a suggestion as to a name for the plane. And right away I wrote down Baton Avenger in honor of John. After quite a while, and we were told that was the name of the bomber, I felt like it was all worthwhile and I'm sure John was happy 
that, that he was being honored. The Bataan Avenger was one of the B-29 bombers that participated in the atomic bomb droppings in Japan. In spring of 1945, the aircraft was flipped over from the explosion of the bomb, barely allowing the crew and a friend of Iris's, Chester Marshall, to avoid the devastation. They were flying over Japan and they, they dropped their bombs and the percussion from the bombs caused the B-29 to flip over. They were flying bottom side up and none of the equipment in the plane was working. They were rapidly going to the ground and a flashlight rolled up next to the controls and one of the crew picked it up, turned it on and he started working on the He turned one button and it turned the lights on in the plane. And then the pilot was able to move all the other things that were necessary to get the plane upright and flying again. I didn't know that the Baton Avenger was involved. But every bombing session that went my heart just crunched. It was difficult to breathe. I felt I was there with them. And when they felt the, the plane had served its purpose, they turned it into a fueling plane. It fueled the planes in the sky. And it went from there to an instructional place and men were taught to fly in the Bataan Avenger. And she disappeared finally. I received a letter from uh, the Historial Society saying that uh, they were trying to keep the only flyable B-29 bomb in the air. They named it Fifi. And I asked how they got it flying and they said they used parts of the planes in the graveyard. I asked if a part of the Baton Avenger might be in Fifi. That keeps me going. And then while I was at work one day, I was told General Wainwright was coming. He went first to Wichita and had his picture taken with the Baton Avenger. And then he came to Fort Riley and I had the very distinct pleasure of saluting that great man. It was about that time, I think, that the first Sergeant Major left Fort Riley and we got a new one the next day. Now his name was James Berry. When he left, I didn't want to go into work the next day because I thought, well, they might scoot me out of there or they might reassign me they might kick me out of the service, whatever. There was no place for me. Instead, the commandant had talked to his man under him, and he said, I want her to be the sergeant major. 
and they all agreed. So that morning, I had just barely sat down when the assistant adjutant came in. He said, well, he always called me kiddo. He said, well, kiddo, what are you going to do today? You don't have a sergeant major. I said, I know, sir, and I started to cry. <laughs> he said, but it's all right. We're fixing it right now. He took my nameplate off my desk moved it over to the sergeant major's desk and said, uh, you are the new sergeant major. And then the sad news came. The commandant had ordered sergeant major for me and there was no such rank in the women's TO. He said that I want a promotion for her and was told, sorry, sir, but she's wearing the highest one available right now. We can't promote her. So here I am, acting Sergeant Major with a T3 rating. And it stayed that way till the end of my service, but I didn't care. I was in heaven. <laughs> Throughout Iris's time in Fort Riley, her position introduced her to people who she thought she would never have the fortune to meet. And although they couldn't stay around for long, the impact they left on Iris's life remains clear. But I met some wonderful people. If you've ever heard of Colonel Tuttle, during the, those years, he was a horseman and he did wonderful things with horses. And I had never met the gentleman, but I was sitting at my desk one day when suddenly I realized there was someone standing by my desk. And I looked up and I said, oh, sir. He says, all right, don't get up. He says, I'm your friend. He said, I want to see you at three o'clock today over at the horse arena. And I, it was such a wonderful offer. I said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm on duty here at this desk until five. And he looked so unbelievable. Finally, he said, well, carry on. And he turned and walked into the adjutant's office. And I forgot it. I was busy. He eventually came back and he says, Sergeant, I'll see you at the horse arena at three o'clock. And the man who was our sergeant major at the time was always accusing me of brown nosing. He says, you've done it again. And he says, you've gone too high. I said, I really don't know what you're saying. He said, don't you know who that was? I said, no, I don't. I've never seen him before. Right at that time, the chief, the assistant warrant assistant um, adjutant came in and he said, you really hit the big one this time, kiddo. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And he said, don't you don't know who that was? And I said, he said, that was the famous Colonel Tuttle. He's been all over the world showing those horses to royalty, to just big people. He said, just how big are you? <laughs> I said, well, sir, I, this is all news to me. And he said, he was told, yes, you definitely could go. So I went and this arena was built up with tiers from the ground floor way up to the top. It would hold thousands and thousands of people. I was the only one there. So I sat down and promptly at three o'clock, Colonel Tuttle came through with four of his horses, most beautiful horses I had ever seen. And they did things that horses don't do. And I think I sat there with my mouth open and my eyes popping for about an hour. When he finished, he said, uh, well, that's all. Sergeant, he, she, he said, you are free to go back to your work. 
and I thanked him, and he went out. But years later, after, well, when you in, are in service, you, uh, in your assigned place, you get friends. You, it just works that way. So there were three other girls from around the country who joined up with me. And uh, one was in Virginia, one was in Georgia, and one was in uh, Arkansas. The one in Arkansas got married and moved to Florida, but she went to work for the government. And one day while she was at work, she called me and she said, Iris, you never guess who was my visitor here just now. And I said, so tell me now. She said it was, well, first she said, do you remember a Colonel Tuttle when you were in the Army? Oh my, yes. And she says, he remembers you too. She said, we were just visiting while he was waiting for an appointment. And he discovered that I was in the Army, in the WAC, and he said, were you in the cavalry school? She said, yes. He said, did you by any chance know a young lady named Iris? And she said, oh my goodness, yes. She says, I went to her wedding. We were best friends. So every time he'd come in, he'd send me a message. I had only met that man once, but he was a friend for life. And Oleg Cassini. He was a fashion designer in New York, big one. Well, he was going to OCS class. And that met every afternoon, Monday through Friday, over in our um, headquarters house. And he found out that I was over there. And as I was going down the hill to OCS class, I was an officer candidate. And when they saw me, one of them started whistling. And when he whistled, it was like a signal for all the other men. And as long as they could see me standing there, they whistled. And it was that way from then on while they were in school. Every day, I got my whistle and I was enjoying it as much as they were. But then they graduated. And the habit was, on graduation day, each new officer carried a dollar bill in his pocket. And I was up on the fourth floor, and I didn't hear what was going on down on the first, but I was on an errand down to the mail department. And as I was coming down from the second floor, I heard, where's my sergeant? I want my sergeant, and it was loud. And he kept it up and kept it up. And finally, as I was coming down the first batch of stairs, he says, there you are, where have you been? And I thought I was being reprimanded. He said, I had to give my dollar away. I was saving it for you. I said, well, would you like to play a replay? And he said, I can't do that. That's not allowed. And that was the last time I saw Lieutenant Cassini. And I never heard from him or anything, just I didn't expect it. He was married to Jean Tierney at the time, and we used to shop at the same commissary, and it was very genial. So just two weeks ago, a package arrived for me where I'm living. I opened it up, and on the top it says Oleg Cassini. And it was a bit of a shock because I knew that he had died 10 years ago at least. I opened it up, and there was one of those little crystal ring holders, just a little memento from Oleg. But you can't get too close 
to people in a situation like that because they're here today and they're gone tomorrow without any knowledge uh, by those left behind. Then my brother, the oldest brother, died in the Battle of the Bulge. My mom was alone at that time, and I felt so guilty that I couldn't be there with her. It must be a horrible thing to lose people like that and never know who was going next. There was another young man. It's hard to tell, tell about him. He came into the whack day room one evening and I was just in the habit of going out with whoever came along. We were friends, just spending time. But when this man came in, there was something different in the air and he knew it too. So he went over and sat down in the opposite corner and one of my girlfriends, Nell, came over to me and she said, Iris, did you meet that man who just came in? And I said, no. And she says, why not? You were supposed to. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I didn't know that. She said, I'll fix it. So she went over to him, introduced herself, and she told him, I want you to meet one of my friends. And they came over to me and she said, he squeezed her hand and he said, it's what I came for. His name was Chuck Williams. I took him home on my first furlough after that. My family dearly loved him, and on our way back to Fort Riley, he said, I have never felt so loved in all my life. That's a different kind of love than I'm used to. And he should have been spoiled. He had nine older sisters. But he went overseas. Before he left, I was boarding the train to go back to Fort Riley. And a voice spoke to me and said, he is not for you. Eventually, there was an elderly man came in and sat down in the seat next to me. And after a while, he says, young lady, I feel your pain. He says, is that your husband? No. Is it a relative? No. It's got to be a fiance. And I said, yes, sir. He said, the Lord will not bring you two together and then send him off to die. Keep that in mind. But he did. For weeks and weeks, I get, went nowhere except to work. Seven days a week, the office. There was nothing else in life. One night, my friends wanted me to come up to the day room to play partner ping pong. And I hadn't been out at all in all that time. And I said, I can't do it. They said, you've got to do something sometime, and it's time now you come up with us. So I went up to the day room, we played our game. And I was ready to leave. When two GIs came in and I paid no attention to them, I walked on out. 
And by the time I got to the barracks, the phone was ringing. And the barracks guard says, Hannibal. I said, I'm just getting in. Well, the phone's for you. One of these young men said he'd like to meet me. And I said, no, I'm sorry, and I hung up. And this went on for three months. Never missed a day calling. And every time it was, no, thank you, and I'd hang up. And a voice spoke to me saying, say yes. So I double dated with him that night. We went to a movie. And I didn't get along with that group at all. And I finally said, I have to go to work tomorrow morning. So thank you for the movie, but I must go in. He says, I'm not going to walk down the hill with you. And I said, no, please. And he kept insisting and finally I thought, well, if I don't say yes to him, he's going to keep me up here all the night. So <laughs> we walked down the foot of the hill and uh, he said, why do you hate me? I said, sir, I don't hate you. I don't know you. And he says, I've been trying for three months to meet you. He said, you don't even know, you didn't know what I look like. I said, that's true. And I told him I lost out on another connection and I wasn't ready to date. And he said, so what is it you don't like? He says, I know you don't. And I said, your company keeps, they're, they're different than people I keep company with. We don't swear, we don't smoke, we don't do a lot of things that they do, and they drink heavily. So he said, I'm not like that. And I laughed. But he said, try me. He said, you don't know me, you really don't. So I went out with him on a Saturday night, and I swear it was an angel I was with. Nothing like these people. Eight months later, I married the man. <laughs> I got married while I was in Fort Riley on January 31st, 1945 because it was payday. <laughs> That's the truth. He was in service um, division. A few days after we were married, he had to go overseas and he was gone for a year. The last month of that year, It's difficult to talk about it. He was missing. When he discovered, to begin with, that he was going overseas, he started writing letters to me every day. And the night he left, he gave me a group of them and he said, I will write to you every day that I'm gone. And it was wonderful up until that last month. I heard nothing. The government couldn't tell me anything. I was home from the service at the time and working at the knitting mill. Every night I walked down to South Beloit 
every day. In 1030 at night, I walked home to Beloit from that. And one evening, a friend who knew that my husband was missing came over and said, uh, how are you getting to work? And I told him, he said, this is the end. He said, I'm taking you home from now on. So when my, I'd come home at night and mom would say, nothing today. And his mom and dad would call and I'd have to say, I'm sorry, there's nothing. Then one night at 12.30, there was a knock on our front door. Mom went to the door and pretty soon she came in to me and said, there's a man at the front door and would like to talk to you. And I was frightened. I said, I don't want to talk to anyone who's going to give me bad news. But she said, you have to go. So I went to the door and there was my husband. He had been en route from Seoul and from California all that time and was not able to communicate with me. But he had written a letter every day that he was gone. We were so wrapped up in ourselves getting reacquainted, I suddenly woke up to the realization that he hadn't called his parents. And I said, oh my goodness. He said, but it's in the middle of the night. I said, what better news do you think your parents could get in the middle of the night but a phone call from a lost son? And he called. And we had to go down there to see them right away as soon as we could get a furlough. So when we went, we went to his sister's home out in the country. And one of the neighbors, I guess, brought his folks out there. I didn't know them. I didn't know what to expect. But his dad got out of the front seat of the car and he was hugging the Selden and mother didn't get out so I went over to the car. I opened the door and there I saw her with two braces, both legs. I didn't have to do a thing. She just reached for me and she's said, my son has brought me an angel. And she called me Tansi. All their children down there had their regular names, but they had extra names. And I had the nicest one of all. And Selden and his dad were talking and his dad said, well, I think she's accepted. He says, Mom has given her a name of Tonsi. And he says, that will be forever. You know that. And it stayed. I love them. They love me. I was still working at the knitting mill and I couldn't afford not to because a few cents then was a lot of money. So I told my husband I'd have to go into work that night. And he said, I'm going with you. I said, I'm never leaving you alone. And when we got down there, he told my boss, either you hire me or you fire her. <laughs> Nothing in between. So they hired him. In the meantime, my orders had come through to go over and serve under General Patton. General Patton was at Sicily at the time. 
My husband said no. He meant it. He said that he had a vision when he was told about my orders and he saw me lying in the battlefield face down. I had so much love in my life. It seemed every way I turned. If I said or did anything that wasn't quite according to what other people thought that I was sitting. I have six children. My husband died in 1988. I still have the Lord. He's very near, very dear. My life is complete. When the war had ended in 1945, those who sacrificed their time, commitment, and lives to defend the United States returned home only to be welcomed by rejoicing citizens celebrating the surrender of Japan and the return of their soldiers. However, the celebration couldn't last forever and those who had served went on to pursue a welcoming future. I guess when I came home from the service, got involved in different things, First, I ran a fabric store, and then an opening was coming up at the McNeeny's department store, and I applied for that, so I became a credit counselor for six and a half years while I was going up through the offices, and finally one day, one of the women on the schedule for, for choosing names for the next year. She came to me and she said, uh, will you run for president? I said, oh, I'd like to. But I said, I think probably I have to get permission from where I'm working. So I spent my time as president of Credit Women. There's such a satisfaction in giving But I do think that all of that uh, notice I got was because of my military service. I do believe I was blessed right before I ever went in service. Because how many people go from basic to NCO and to Army administration? It just doesn't happen. Throughout the pain and joy, Iris has learned many new life lessons to share on to others in need of inspiration. Uh, just believe in the Lord. Be positive about your friendships and anyone you meet. You be nice to them and I believe they'll be nice to you. We don't have to be at war. Just whatever you do, do your very, very best. You'll never fail. Throughout my time working on this documentary, I have come across times of frustration and exhaustion, but knowing that in the end it would all be worth it, I pushed on, because I knew I would be helping to pass on stories that are truly moving and inspiring to me and anyone else who was fortunate enough to come across them. When I first met Iris in person, I was nervous in that I wouldn't know what to say or do to carry on a conversation, or how fragile I would have to be with her. But once she hugged me, I felt as if I were being hugged by a grandmotherly figure who was strong and filled with love for those around her. When she spoke of her friendships and experiences, you could see the joy that she had in her eyes. She truly felt grateful for having a chance to have met these great people in her life, but you could also see the pain for those she has lost. As many times that I have seen this documentary, there is not one time that I didn't cry for Iris. 
but I truly am grateful and honored for being given the chance to meet such an amazingly strong person and to help her tell her story. Iris has taught me that it truly is better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all, and throughout her life she continues to remain positive and rather looks at her losses as a chance to share a wonderful friend's story, and as she does so, the friendships and love continue to live through her. But I have enjoyed this. It's so wonderful to be free to tell your life experience. Let's face it, I've had a lovely life. It was pure pleasure. Like. <laughs> well, it's quite a ways to walk, <laughs> but thank you.